Well, Valley family, so good to be with you this weekend. Yes, we've got services on Saturday and Sunday, and we're thankful for the folks in the room and also for our Valley family online. We're grateful that you're a faithful group that watches regularly. In fact, our numbers throughout the COVID period increased quite a bit, not only here locally, but globally, people watching around the country and at times around the world. So thank you for being with us today. I have the honor of preaching a message on the identity that we have in Christ Jesus. Pastor Jeremy's been in a series through the book of Ruth, and we're going to take a little pause on that, but it ties in beautifully, but this will be a standalone on identity in Christ. But I do want to make some connections to the book of Ruth. But before I do, I've got to give props to the band. I know they already walked out, but would you give them a loud hand clap? I'm thankful for our worship team. You know, I've learned more and more and more just to appreciate the talented group that we have here at Valley Church. My son, he just started with a rock and roll school, and he's learning the bass guitar. And I play a couple instruments, but I fake it till I make it. I'm not uber talented like these guys up here. But Noah has his first concert tomorrow. And so not only has he been practicing a lot at the school and with his band that he's a part of, but also he's been practicing at home. And so I've just been hearing rock and roll real loud the last several weeks. And so I rock out with him as well. We're looking forward to his concert. You know, with Noah, I'll share a little snippet with you because I love my kids, both my kids, Calvin and Noah. But my oldest, Noah, you know, he's more of a lead singer. You know, he's more of a guitar player. He's more front of house kind of guy. But we started him on the bass. But I don't know if you've ever seen that skit on Saturday Night Live with Will Ferrell playing the uh, cowbell. That's like Noah on the bass. He always kind of works his way to the front, that even though he's supposed to be the low-key bass guitar player, he's singing in the background. He's working toward the front of the stage. So we're proud of him, and we're excited to be at his concert. In fact, tomorrow I'll preach both services, and then I race over there to do a little bit of rock and roll. So that's going to be a lot of fun. Um, I, I do want to mention a few verses. If you would open up your Bible and we're going to dive in here. We're going to go through several scripture passages today, but I want to give you a few of them, even out the gate, some of our key verses, 1 Peter 2, 9 and 10, we're going to jump into in just a moment. In fact, you can flip there, and then we'll be in Romans and Galatians. But as I said, I want to make some connections with the book of Ruth because there's so much about identity throughout that entire book. In fact, Boaz saw in Ruth what others did not see. Jesus sees something inside of each of us. Boaz gives Ruth everything that he has. He gave her his wealth, gave his name, gave his identity to her. Boaz is the kinsman redeemer. This is a topic that Jeremy's going to address even this coming weekend, that kinsman redeemer statement. Jesus is our redeemer and Jesus gives us his identity. When we become a new believer, when we put our faith in Jesus, when we respond to the gospel, we have a new identity and that identity is in Christ and Christ alone. But see, in our world, identity drives everything about life. Everything about life. You likely have in your wallet right now some form of ID with you, even as you sit in this service or you're watching online. In fact, some of you listen to us while you're in your car. You better have that driver's license with you right now in case the popo pull you over. But all of us have a form of ID, whether that's that driver's license or maybe it's a work-related card. But what's on it? We've, we see our name, we see a picture, some identifying characteristic like an address. There's details about you on that ID. Often there's a signature on the card representing your choice to enter into contract with the issuing authority. Maybe that's with the DMV and in turn with the government. How many love the DMV? Come on. 
but they've made more available online throughout COVID. Yes, there is perks of COVID. You can get it all done right there, but everybody is carrying an ID. Identities tell us who we are. It tells where you live, how and where you can travel. Yes, you need ID to travel. Our identity drives what we can buy with our finances and it qualifies us for employment. And that's why we are so glued to having an ID and it's absolutely devastating when it's stolen. Thank God I've never had it happen, but I've had many that it has happened to. Whether it was stolen, whether it was lost, it takes some work to go out and get a new ID and get the credit cards and the debit cards and the banking info redone. But knowing our spiritual identity is all the more important. Here we value these things talked about in the introduction, but all the more important is our spiritual identity. Many of you have heard that the government offers a witness protection program. In fact, there's many movies about this. And to those who testify against organized crime, they can get a new identity. The witnesses helpless against the revenge of those criminals. They receive this new identity and all the details that go along with it. A new name, a new background, a new address. Yes, even a new career. But this is the one catch. They can never go back to being what they were before. It's a completely new life. It's completely starting over. And isn't it interesting? That's what God does for you and for me. We each have a new spiritual identity the minute we responded to the gospel. And there are wonderful perks to discovering this new position, this new identity that we have because of what Jesus accomplished. It's nothing that we've done. It's because of what he has done for us. So we see in society that the world often doesn't validate this new identity that we have in Christ. See, from a worldly point of view, you and I are exactly the same as we've always been. Carrying that same baggage. It's still hanging around our neck. And even we seem to hold on to the memories of all that we've done wrong in the past. But yes, every single Christian is a new creation with a new identity in Christ declaring God. It declares our authority. And it declares the gospel. So I want to dive into this deep tonight. Who are you in Christ and what are the benefits that you have because of this new identity? When you became a Christian, when I became a Christian, I was told that I had been adopted, that I had this adoption and I've been now a part of God's family and was a new person in Christ. And it sounds great. It sounded good to me, sounded nice, sounded perfect, but I didn't have a clue what it meant until much later in my spiritual journey. But if I had understand it earlier, I believe that I might have spared years of struggle. And so today I want to share six biblical truths with you about your new identity in Christ and the benefits that come along with it. And I believe this will help you avoid self-accusation, doubt, and uncertainty in your spiritual walk. If you would, go ahead and pull out that note sheet. We work hard on these every single time that we preach. There's some content there, and on the back, there's some questions for you to meditate on, whether in your life group or in your personal reflection time, in your devotional time. I challenge you to dive deep into these note sheets. I say this every time I preach. You know, we've only got about 30, 35 minutes but you've got all week, and I challenge you to be a Berean and dive deeper into the Word of God and what we're able to discuss here. You can go a lot further in your devotional time. Here's truth number one that I want to start with today. 
We are God's children. It seems simple, but many of us forget this quickly for a multitude of reasons. You know, I talked about my kids just a moment ago. I love my kids. This is an illustration that Jeremy's used before about his own sons, and it applies in the same way. For me and my sons and for all of you, the fact that if Noah or Calvin goes to my fridge and pulls out a snack, milk, and cookies or whatever it may be, I don't scold them for doing that because that's a daily son. They have everything I have. That's my kids. They're a part of who I am. They're my family. They're my blood. I think about that concert that I mentioned. Noah needed some fixes on his bass guitar. I didn't think nothing about it. I had to take it down to the music shop and get it fixed. I didn't come home and tell him or blame him that I had to spend that money. No, that's my son. I'm proud of him. He's a part of the family. He has the daily identity. He's blood. Many of you have raised children. Many of you sitting in this room. Many of you online. You can see a lot of yourself in your kids because they identify with you, their family, their blood. You know, Noah recently wrote a paper for his school, and he could choose anything, but it needed to be a research paper. And on his own accord, he chose to research how to become a pastor. And I want to read you just the first paragraph. In fact, I shared this on my social media because, yes, I shed a few tears on this one. It's hard for Isaac Daly to cry, but this will soften me right up. This was his first paragraph. I just read this a few days ago for the first time. It says, I want to become a pastor because I look up to my dad. Being a pastor is cool because we get to worship God and help people. I will be good at this career because I've been practicing since I was four years old. He's only 10, but he's building a resume. Come on, somebody. In this document, you can learn a lot about becoming a pastor. And he went on paragraph after paragraph to share his thoughts on this. But it came to mind as I was preparing for this message. You know, whether Noah becomes a pastor or not, I'm going to be proud of Noah. Whether pastoral ministry is part of who he is and that's part of his identity in years to come, that's great. But even if it's not, I will be proud of Noah. That's my son. That's my blood. You know, even growing up for me, my dad was a pastor. My grandpa was a pastor. But they never put pressure on us to be pastors. In fact, I think that's ironically why we all did become pastors. Because there wasn't this pressure. We didn't, I don't find, I'm not Isaac because I'm a pastor. I'm a pastor because Jesus called me to be a pastor. And we all have our own identities as we walk in this place, but we also have a common identity. And that's what we're going to be talking about tonight. And that's children, that we're children of God, that we're heirs, that we're accepted. And so I want to make sure you fill in the blanks if there is any. I hope they added some there. If not, then it's a cheat sheet. Then you have all the notes right in front of you. We are God's children. Some see themselves as God's un favored foster children the christians with perfect faces and tidy lives we think those are his real children but as we look at scripture as we dive in to scripture and we see more and more about god's love like we see in first john chapter 4 and we talk about being part of a loving family not the shattered family that many of us have experienced, we begin to see our true status as God's dearly loved children. And when we receive Jesus as our Lord and Savior, we enter God's family and we're no longer orphans, slaves, beggars, strangers. We're no longer prisoners. Neither are we foster kids or distant cousins, employees, or team members, or even a part of his management staff, we become permanent members of God's family in every ideal sense of the word. We're children of God. And so in turn, we get the benefits of being his children. In fact, this is declared all throughout scripture. 
I am a child of God. John 1, 12. But to all who have received him, those who believe in his name, he has given the right to become children. And as a child, I'm a fellow heir with Christ. Romans 8, 17, it says, and if children, then heirs, namely heirs of God and also fellow heirs with Christ. If indeed we suffer with him, so we may also be glorified with him. Wow, he did the work, but we reap the reward. I am no longer a slave, but I'm a child and an heir. Galatians 4, 7, so you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if you are a son, then you are also an heir through God. Some of us have a hard time swallowing even the metaphor of being a child of God. Maybe because you didn't have a good father experience. Maybe you didn't have a father in your life at all. Or maybe not even a mother in your life at all. And yet, God demonstrates the perfect picture of what a father is. And we can cling to that. And he calls us his children. Truth number two, I want you to take a look. We have access to the Father. We have access to the Father. As children of God, we have access to our Father. Ephesians 2.18, for through him, we both have access in one spirit to our heavenly Father. In the old movie, Anna and the King, which was released in 1999, Showing my age a little bit. Getting a little bit older now. Yes, I've watched this movie. I like this movie. The king's young daughter, fearing something that occurred in her classroom, she sought some help. So she raced through elaborate courtyard gardens, up the palace marble steps, and down a gilded hall. Breathing heavily at that point, she stopped short of the grand hall's entrance and peeked inside. There's dozens of men knelt in reverence before the enthroned king while dignitaries petitioned him with their concerns. It was a busy moment. But undeterred, the little girl walked her way through the bowing men, scooted around the dignitaries, and climbed the steps to the throne. She scampered onto the king's lap, and she whispers in his ear, and the king drops everything to come to her aid and to calm her fears. In fact, turning away many of the dignitaries and saying, my daughter's here, I want to focus on her, and others, other matters would have to wait because his child needed him. She had access to her father, and because we are God's children he is constantly available to us. Yes, we can climb confidently onto our heavenly Father's lap. We can approach the throne of grace, as Hebrews 4.16 puts it, and we can whisper into his ear anytime, any place, no matter what the circumstance may be, just as this king in the movie responded to his daughter's cry for help, God delights to talk with his children. We can approach him. He is approachable. I don't care what your experience was in your own home. Our heavenly father is approachable and he's waiting to spend time with you. Here's truth number three. I want you to take a look. We are condemnation free. We are condemnation free in a world that portrays God as a stern school monitor waiting to smack our knuckles, we all need to be reminded over and over and over that God instead meets us with grace and with forgiveness. Romans 8 verse 1 reminds us of this, says there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Some say, man, this is too easy. This is fluffy gospel. What do I have to do? There's something more that I've got to do. There's something I've got to do to make up for all the mistakes that I've made. I lived that way for so many years, even after being a Christian, a believer, and yes, even after becoming a pastor, living on that hamster wheel. And it wasn't until someone told me this, that I started to wrap my mind and heart around the grace of God. 
A mentor said this to me, so you think what Jesus did wasn't good enough for you, Isaac? What Jesus did wasn't good enough for you? See, by saying you have to do more to make up for your bad acts, you're essentially saying that Jesus' sacrifice, his death, burial, and resurrection, that it wasn't sufficient to pay the cost for your sin. But according to Scripture, my sinful attitudes, my sinful actions did require a punishment to satisfy a righteous God's justice. But see, Jesus, he paid that price. He took on that cost. And then he gives us an opportunity to be his children and to live in this freedom. And because of it, we do not face condemnation from God. There is no condemnation. Romans 8, 1, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. If you've responded to the gospel, there's no condemnation. Here's number four, a truth that we need to be aware of is that we are changed. It's not we are changed, but this. We are changed. How different the world would be if every believer knew, really knew, really clung to the reality that he or she is changed in Christ. 2 Corinthians talks about it. One of the most important assurances that we have is of God's ongoing presence with us. He dwells within us. As believers, the Holy Spirit lives inside of us. We don't have to stay mired in bad choices or in unhealthy behaviors. The same power that enabled Jesus to rise from the dead is available to you and to me. Romans talks about it. Ephesians chapter 1, 19 and 20 talk about it. We are part of God's royal family. We are the king's kids, but we have to learn royal ways. And yes, we're going to mess up. We don't forget that part easily at all because we probably fulfilled that part of the story today and yesterday and the day before. Yes, we're going to mess up. We can count on it. But that doesn't change the truth that God's spirit permanently resides within us and his power makes us new. You're a new creation in Christ. Here's another promise in scripture. In Christ Jesus, I have wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. 1 Corinthians 1.30 says this, he is the reason you have a relationship with Christ Jesus who became for us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. My body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who dwells in me. 1 Corinthians 6, 19, do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit lives inside of you? One more, Corinthians 6, 17, but the one united with the Lord is one spirit with him. And so because of it, we're joined to the Lord and have one spirit with him. Here's truth number five. Take a look. We are the recipients of God's faithfulness. We are the recipients of God's faithfulness. 1 Thessalonians 5:24 it reminds us the one who calls you is faithful and he will do it. Philippians 1:6 tells us this, he who began a good work in you will carry it to completion. Man, that's such an incredible promise. God promises to keep us blameless. Until he comes, he says he will accomplish what he started. The God whose compassions never fail and are new every morning is our God. Lamentations 3, 22 and 23. See, all of us, new believers and old, will sometimes fail in this walk of faith, on this journey. But we need that regular assurance from the scriptures and from one another, reminding one another that God loves us, that he hears us, that he refuses to condemn us, that he empowers us and is ever faithful to us. That leads me to truth number six. 
And this is purely from Scripture that one of our main texts for the evening mentioned it at the front end of the message, 1 Peter 2, 9 and 10. Here it is. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. You were hand-selected by God. So we see the truth that you are a chosen people, that you're a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, a people that are a part of this new family. You're not an accident but you've been planned. No matter what your parents said or didn't say, no matter what they planned or didn't plan for, God had a plan. You were born with purpose. God created you. He designed you. He knit you in your mother's womb. You were chosen before the world was formed. God knew you. God loves you. We see this all throughout Psalms, but particularly Psalm 139. Your royal sons and daughters of the king. You've been, quote, set apart. When you become a Christian, this incredible life change takes place. God has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. You have a new relationship with God and you can call him dad, as we see in Romans 8 15. You have a new relationship even with other Christians because of your identity in Christ. You're part of a nation, a family, the body of Christ. You're not a possession, but rather a priceless treasure to God. Deuteronomy 7, 6. Many of you guys have seen, whether online or maybe someone sent it to you, these promises, these declarations that connect us with our identity in Christ. In fact, you can find them pretty easily online. I want to challenge you, even as an action point this week, to pick five or six, whether from the ones that I'm going to say in just a moment or whatever you have in your devotional life, these truths, because we so easily forget our identity. In fact, Every day I try to pick four or five of these and I even say them out loud. That's how easy I forget my identity in Christ. And so it's almost like a declaration. Now, hear me clearly. I'm not saying this is a fix-all or if you do this, every problem goes away. But I tell you what, we need to understand our new life in Christ. And anything that you're facing in your life, oftentimes it goes back to the reality that we're forgetting something about the gospel and our identity in him. We need that constant reminder. I want to share some of these with you, and Ben's going to put the scriptures up on the screen that go along. I'll read a few of them, but you'll see them right up on the screen. I'm a branch of the true vine and a conduit of Christ's life. I'm a friend of Jesus. I've been justified and redeemed. My old self was crucified with Christ, and I'm no longer a slave to sin. I've been set free from the law of sin and death. I've been accepted by Christ. I want to read this one, Romans 15, 7. Receive one another, then just as Christ also received you to God's glory. I've been called to be a saint. God leads me in the triumph and knowledge of Christ. I'm a new creation in Jesus Christ. I've become the righteousness of God in Christ. I've been made one with all who are in Christ Jesus. I've been set free. I'm going to read this one, Galatians 5.1. For freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not be subject again to the yoke of of slavery. My former church was called Liberty. And I love that name because it was a constant reminder of freedom that we carry in Christ, the liberty that we have in Christ. 
this new identity. I've been blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. I am chosen, holy, and blameless before God. I'm redeemed and forgiven by the grace of God. See, all of this is made possible because of his grace. I've been sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. I've been made alive with Christ. I'm seated in the heavenly places with Christ. I've been brought near to God by the blood of Christ. I am a, num- uh, I am a member of Christ's body and a partaker of his promise. I have boldness and confidence, confident access to God through faith in Christ. I want to read this one, Ephesians 3.12, in whom we have boldness and confident access to God because of Christ's faithfulness. Take us right back to that truth that we have access to our Father. My new self is righteous and holy. I am a citizen of heaven. The peace of God guards my heart and mind. Man, I pray this one over my life on a regular basis. The peace of God, the peace that surpasses all understanding, guards our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. God supplies all of my needs. I've been made complete in Christ. I've been raised up with Christ. My life is hidden with Christ in God. I am holy and beloved. Let's read that text, Colossians 3.12. Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourself with a heart of mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. We are beloved. We are holy because of the gospel. Several weeks ago, Dr. Andrew Farley and Tim Chalice were here at the church, and boy, they did a great job. They were talking from their brand new book, The Perfect You. Many of you probably purchased that book. They had many, many copies here, and I don't know if they sold out, but I know a lot of them sold, and uh, I'm glad because it's a wonderful book. In fact, I'm doing a book study with a group of guys right now, and we're going through this book together. I've done a lot, a lot of life groups over the years, a lot of small groups, a lot of men's groups, and to each his own, but for me, I love going through good books and learning from one another, and the book spawns such wonderful discussion, and this one in particular, and when we were in chapter two, this section that I want to share with you really popped out at me even before planning to share about our identity in Christ. This is what it says, our search. We're all searching for our authentic selves. We want to know who am I? What am I like on the inside? What makes me fulfilled? What does my future hold? These questions will never be answered without looking to our creator. The answers we seek are only found in him. He is the one who made us, he understands us, and he loves us exactly as we are. So instead of chasing someone else's definition of who you are and who you're supposed to be, I invite you today to see yourself from God's vantage point. It's the only view that's completely true. And in turn, what you believe about yourself and your heart will shape everything that you do. We are his creation. And to understand ourselves, we must consult with the creator. If he created us, we should be consulting with our creator. He's the one who handcrafted us. He knows us intimately. This is why we look to him to see who we are at the core, not our mirrors, not what other people say about us, not even our self-perception. God has left nothing to chance. He planned your new life from every angle. And in the gospel, You will discover the profound meaning and purpose of your life. You'll no longer see yourself as an undesirable obstacle to God, but as his precious instrument. Man, that's a different view. And from the world, maybe from your workplace, maybe from the home that you grew up in, 
You hear the opposite of everything that you heard today. But the gospel reminds us now who we are because of him, the family that we're a part of, the benefits that we share as children of God. I want to ask the uh, band to come up. They're going to share a closing song in just a moment. And as they come, if you would, those in the room, just bow your heads, close your eyes, even those online. Again, I want to thank those that take time to be with us online, whether you're here in Vacaville, whether you're in Solano County, maybe you're in another state or even in another country. I don't believe it's by accident that you're watching this broadcast today. You also need to be reminded of who you are in Christ and this new identity. Maybe there's someone watching right now on our broadcast that has never responded to the gospel. Maybe you're listening to this and saying, man, it sounds great. I want to be a part of the family of God. If that's you, don't let this day pass you by. Let this be that moment. Scripture says that if we confess with our mouths and believe in our hearts, that you will be saved. By faith in Jesus, we respond to the gospel and you can be a part of his family. He loves you. He gave his life for you. No matter what you've been through over 2020 and now in 2021, Boy, I don't know what I would have done this last year without the grace of God, without being a part of his family. So God, I thank you so much for this reality tonight that we see when we study our identity in you, that we are children of God, that we're heirs, that we receive the benefits because of these truths that we're a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, that we belong to you. We thank you that gospel means good news. And yes, some of it sounds almost too good to be true. But we thank you that it is true, that we find hope and life and encouragement even now. I know there's some in this room, some online that have faced challenges even this week. And yet we cling again to the hope that we find in you, Jesus. God, I thank you for what you're doing here at Valley Church. I thank you for what you're doing through this church, through this generous church. You're doing so much here in Vacaville and really around the world. We thank you for it. We thank you that we can be a part of this family. So we look to you today. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to sing this song together. If you're in the room, would you stand? And I'll be back up in a moment to close us out.